Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, good. Thank you very much. I was told to stand right here. So if it starts rotating or anything, just I'll make the most of it. Continuously, perhaps. Yeah, exactly. So uh, thank you very much, Moab, for that kind introduction. Thanks also to uh, Ima, who organized this wonderful meeting. Uh, Andrea Samprini and others have been working together for many years. As Moab said, we met uh, close to 20 years ago or so. He's been working with Ima for over a decade, uh, trying to advance continuous manufacturing technologies. So uh, it's a great honor to be here at the very beginning of the meeting. And since I'm giving the first talk, I thought I would start by giving an overview. So I'll spend maybe about 10 minutes or so giving an overview on continuous manufacturing, a bit of a timeline. And then I'll segue and talk about some new technologies that we've been developing um, that I'm kind of excited about. Um, I thought I'd start out, we'll see how this works in... Uh, in Italy, in Italian, uh, by telling kind of a story that one of my mentors often tells about a U.S. university. So the question is, how many students go to University of Bologna? And the answer is, one out of a hundred, right? <laughs> because the question is, how do you define student? Is it the students who are signed up, uh, registered in the in the office of you know, registration office, or is it the top students, the students who are really dedicated, the ones who study, the ones who strive? And so usually it's about like one out of a hundred. So who are the top? And so I want you to keep that in mind as I talk about starting now, continuous manufacturing, how we define it. Because the term is used a lot to kind of cover, let's say, zero to 100 percent of technologies. But what we're striving for is a particular definition of continuous, um, which I would say is kind of the top uh, 1 percent. Uh, and what we're aiming towards, which we have not quite achieved. And so with that, let me start out. And so this uh, diagram is something that we've been presenting now for over a decade. Uh, it's a continuous pipeline end-to-end, -end. and so this is what I'll talk about for the next 10 minutes, where we are in achieving something like what's depicted in those graphics to achieve this one out of 100. So here's a bit of a timeline, and just to make sure my early days were right, uh, Dr. Nasser kindly uh, uh, confirmed what I thought was some of the original dates. So really continuous manufacturing, I think, starts out with a PAT, Process Analytical Technology. Uh, the initiative at the FDA was 2002, uh, which kind of segued into quality by design, 2004. Those are really the precursors of continuous manufacturing. And I'll, I'll show you over the next few minutes in our definition of continuous manufacturing is essentially just the ultimate of quality by design. So, as Dr. Nasser said, we launched in 2007 the Novartis MIT Center for Continuous Manufacturing uh, at MIT. Uh, we were also very um, fortunate to have Dr. Janet Woodcock as the keynote speaker there. And she's been the keynote speaker in all of our key meetings over the past decade since then. Uh, and in that meeting, we had a vision for a quantum leap uh, to continuous manufacturing. And by that, we mean these four elements. A systems approach to design. So we design the entire process together, end to end. And in terms of solid, uh, oral solid dosage forms, we mean from chemical precursor all the way to final dosage, whether it's tablet or other coating, if it's uh, a coated tablet. We also mean integration. So the entire process is developed as a whole, and so it's integrated. So the consequences of step one on step 10 are taken into account in the design. Together with that, we have model-based control, so it can be fully automated, uh, and ideally with as close to a first principles model as possible. Okay, so model based on the underlying chemistry and physics. 
And then continuous flow. And you notice that I put continuous flow as the fourth part of this four-part definition of continuous. Uh, it's an important part of continuous, but at least in my view, and I think the view of many of my colleagues who've been working in this area for over a decade, uh, it's sort of the least important. The other three are the most important. Okay, so this is a slide that we started presenting shortly after we went full scale in 2007 to work on it. Um, and so the idea was around 2010, in the middle here, this was a PAT target, quality target. That was uh, Novartis's um, way of presenting it. But the point is that we went from the past with disconnected process steps that you see here on the left to the middle where the process steps and they're under, under, are understood and the impact of one step on the subsequent steps are understood, leading to this vision of continuous manufacturing, uh, seamlessly integrated and well-characterized processes. And in 2007, around 2015, seemed to be a long ways away. Now it's 2019. Uh, this is actually the original slide I wanted to present to you. So we did have the greater than sign. And so the question is, how much greater than 2015? So um, I'm going to show you that. Whoops. I don't know if this thing's still on, but I'm going to show you that we're not quite there yet and uh, give you hopefully some inspiration to help get us there. But that's what we thought it would be around 2015. What are some of the advantages? Um, these are advantages that we, but others pretty much uh, agree with these. Um, I was really surprised way back then to understand that even in 2007, the operational asset effectiveness, which is the actual use of equipment we're here at EMA, leading producer of pharmaceutical equipment. So EMA and other equipment in the past has been used approximately 20 to 40% of the time, and the 40% is probably an overestimate. Um, the idea was to increase that with the lean and quality by design to about half on average, um, and then leading to continuous greater than 80%, perhaps close to 95 or 100%. Yeah. <laughs> Better? Okay, thanks. Ah, that even sounds better. To get close to 100%. In pretty much every other industry, equipment is used 95% plus. When I talk to people in other industries, they're surprised about the pharma industry. The other thing, just to present this other f number, is the throughput time. That is the time when you start from a chemical precursor to the time you have your actual product, which you can package product, which you can ship off for marketing. So that time is shockingly greater than six months, typically. The idea is to reduce that, and with integrated continuous manufacturing, that can be a matter of days. So again, Here's the, our icon for the vision. And this, again, is the definition, thinking about that vision, focusing on systems, integration, model-based control, and fourth, but not the least, is uh, continuous flow. What are some of the advantages? OK, so I talked about advantages in terms of operational asset effectiveness, use of uh, capital equipment, also in terms of throughput time. What are some of the consequences of those? And uh, we actually published a white paper just recently this summer. Um, several of the speakers here are co-authors, including Dr. Nasser, uh, and that elaborates many more of the advantages. I just include a few uh, key advantages here. Significant cost savings. You can imagine better use of equipment, but also better use of space, floor space, um, fewer or much less waste, uh, much less OPEX in general, uh, in addition to CAPEX. Not only that, some of the things that I think even are more important about the benefits to society, reduction of drug shortages. There are over 200 drugs on the FDA shortage list. Um, and continuous processing is a way to address those. Related to that, security issues. If there's some uh, epidemic or otherwise, and we need a lot of medicine quickly, 
continuous manufacturing technologies have the potential to produce that medicine in a matter of days as opposed to months or even close to a year. Stockpiling of vital medicines. So currently, countries stockpile these medicines. Uh, they expire, they're discarded. That's a waste of money, but it also uh, presents a challenge. How much do you stockpile? What if you need more? What do you stockpile? So continuous manufacturing has the potential to address that too. Uh, generally, in general, a streamlined supply chain. And we've been talking about personalized medicine for a long time. And continuous manufacturing presents a viable approach to personalized medicine. You're not going to be able to do it with the existing facilities that we have for the most part. Okay, so let's continue this timeline which I started introducing a few minutes ago. So from PAT and Quality by Design, inauguration of the center in 2011, uh, in an effort at MIT at our center, it's led by Salvatore uh, Masha, who, I mean, I was the director, but he was leading the end-to-end -end, uh, facility. He's going to speak later this afternoon. 2011, we ran that uh, first process at MIT. End-to-end. -end. It was a bench-scale research process, but it demonstrated that it could be done. We showed it, and it demonstrated the benefits. I won't go into details. This has all been published. It's 2011. I'd like to talk about some newer things. But here's a picture. We have a video of the process if anyone's interested. Many of you have probably seen it. Um, there's a paper that was published in 2013 in Angevog de Chimie about this. Um, the space has now been repurposed, but that's a picture of what this uh, facility looked like. Next on the timeline, starting in 2015, that was the first uh, continuous drug product process uh, that was approved by the FDA. Uh, since then, there have been six approvals. Uh, generally, these approvals are all for direct compression. Now, um, what I wanted to do is kind of take a, another step back in time. This is a picture I got from the internet. It's 1950s pharmaceutical process facility. Um, I assume they made some kind of vaccines or something. I'm not sure exactly what they made. Um, today, and this is not a continuous process, but I think if you look at some of the continuous facilities, I didn't have permission to present pictures of them. They don't look much different than this. This is a batch facility. But you can see qualitatively that even today, and if you have had the chance to see a continuous, some of these facilities that have been approved, um, it doesn't look, they don't look much different. They don't look like this wide pipe vision that we had starting well over a decade ago. Let me contrast that now with the automotive industry. So this is also a picture I got from the web, 1950s in the automotive industry. You see workers there, assembly line. They don't have to wear Tyvek suits like they do in pharmaceutical facilities. And if you can see just to the right of the picture, there's a canteen. Uh, so that's kind of what it looked like in the, in the 50s. Now here's a picture of an automotive facility today. Fully automated, robotics, uh, what you would imagine a uh, manufacturing facility would look like in the 21st century. Okay. Unfortunately, pharmaceutical manufacturing facilities analogously don't look like this, like facilities in almost every other industry. So while we have made a lot of progress over a decade plus, uh, I think the consensus in the continuous manufacturing community is that we can do a lot more. Another contrast, development of new therapeutics. I wanted to put this, uh, include this here as kind of key therapeutics. I know the focus here is on solid uh, oral dosage forms, but look at the innovation. 2017, gene therapy, first gene therapy product was approved. 2017, CAR-T, so just two years ago, actually less than two years ago. 2018, siRNA. Cutting-edge te cutting technologies that have been researched for over a decade, but are now coming out. To me, these seem like the analogy of that automotive, fully automated, robotic automotive facility, but for therapeutics. 
So I present all this with the hope that this can help be an inspiration. I know EMA is doing a lot, as are other companies, to try to get us close to this vision. Um, and, and, and we're there in terms of development of new therapeutics. We have to catch up and get there in terms of development of manufacturing technologies, uh, which means continuous manufacturing technologies. Okay, why have we been so slow? So everyone pretty much agrees with the great benefits. If we could somehow snap our fingers overnight and have continuous manufacturing across the industry, um, we, would, we would see all these benefits today. But we're not there yet. We need a path to get there. So the challenge isn't the end. Everyone agrees that the end is very beneficial. The challenge is the pathway to get there. One of the reasons that it's been a challenge, in our view, because we've been thinking about this a lot, is that it's still not in the minds of the very upper echelons of management. In the boardroom, they talk about new therapies, they talk about marketing, they talk about all kinds of things, uh, but to the degree necessary for transformation, they don't talk about continuous manufacturing. So we're working to change that, um, but it's going to take time. Regulatory authority authorities are very encouraging. Uh, Dr. Nasser, um, who introduced me this morning, will give a talk shortly afterwards, has been encouraging of this for over a decade when he was a high-level FDA official. Dr. Janet Woodcock, the head of CEDAR, has been very encouraging. Uh, the EMA has been very encouraging, as have been local regulatory agencies. But the industry is very conservative in terms of its regulatory approaches. So we hope with time and with the development of technologies, like at EMA, uh, this will change. And here's kind of, since I'm an academic engineer, we do modeling. So this is my model for what I think will happen. Uh, this is continuous manufacturing progress. I think we're still on the left side. It's going up slowly, but at least it's moving, as I've shown, up and up and up. And at some point, there'll be an inflection point. Uh, that's the case with all new technologies. There'll be an inflection point, and it'll be adopted. Uh, the question is, I have a question mark there, when that timing will be, when that inflection point will be. We actually thought in 2007 it would have occurred by now. Um, maybe it would be 2025, hopefully not much later than that. Okay, so having given that overview of continuous manufacturing, uh, the benefits, why I think uh, we should adopt continuous manufacturing, also why it's been a little slow, I want to talk about a couple technologies that we've been developing, uh, which I'm very excited about. Um, one of them we, we've published, and actually Continuous Pharma, again, Dr. Salvatore Masha will speak uh, this afternoon, uh, is also working to develop this into a commercial process. Uh, but I'll talk about some research from our laboratory in terms of crystallization directly on an excipient for direct processing to final dosage form. And then I'll talk about a new technology that I'm very excited about. This is something I've been working on uh, recently, continuous lyophilization. So again, the idea is, if you look at the top of this graph, that we think about continuous processing, when we think about it, we think about the process as a whole. So typically, we're divided into drug substance and drug product. So drug substance delivers for solid oral dosage forms, typically crystals. But why should we have this divide between drug substance ending in crystals and drug product? So we've been developing a technology that tries to bridge the gap between batch crystallization, let's say, going to granulation, maybe milling, blending, these kind of steps, to final tabulating or encapsulation, to a new process in which we introduce in the drug substance, actually there's no more drug substance than drug product, it's just one continuous process, but we introduce in what would be called drug substance, the excipient, which we've designed on the molecular level to interact with the API to go directly to continuous purification and then uh, final particulates. And so 
I, I wanted to bring your attention to this example because I think it's relevant to the big picture idea of continuous as a systems approach and integration, but also because there's a molecular basis here. And typically in drug product, we don't think about the molecular basis uh, so much. So hopefully you'll, you'll appreciate this. So the idea is that, again, in the red box here, we have an API solution, could be purified or to be purified, and the excipient becomes the template for crystallization of the API. And I'll talk about the process right below that. Um, and then the bottom is that one has to choose excipients with the right molecular level properties in order to crystallize the API directly on the excipients, somewhat as a template, as I'll show. So there are two different challenges. First is, how can we choose the substrate? Okay, how do you design your excipient, not just for the various properties that you want in the drug product side, but also for templating your API? See, holistic approach. We're designing the whole formulation together with the process and the properties that we want. The other issue is secondary nucleation or bulk nucleation. So we want to template nucleation of the excipient of, of, sorry, of the API on the excipient, but not the API by itself in bulk. So how do we select a given uh, substrate for a given API? So the first idea is, what if we choose matching crystal lattices? So if we choose a crystal lattice that templates uh, that of the API, with about the same kind of lattice parameters, perhaps that would be the best choice. For example, some of you might be familiar with silver iodide, which is used for templating rain in clouds. It's put in clouds and it templates rain because the lattice parameter of that is about the same as the lattice parameter of ice. So here's an example of matching lattices with the substrate. And this is, without going into the details, uh, if we choose, say, D-mannitol, a typical excipient, with acetaminophen or paracetamol, we can see that, that the lattice is incommensurate. Okay? So it doesn't actually match. However, we find that we actually do get crystal interaction. And so this is an example from uh, X-ray diffraction, single crystal X-ray diffraction, in which we've matched the lattice we're, sorry, we have not matched the lattice of the mannitol with the API, but somehow they still crystallize, the API crystallizes on the mannitol. Okay, why is that? The answer is because the crystal lattice geometry is not enough. One has to look at the energetics. And so on the molecular level, we're able to calculate the interaction energy between the API and the substrate, acetaminophen and mannitol in this case. And we have to calculate these for the different crystal lattices, and we find the lowest energy configuration. And so in the laboratory, that leads both with D-mannitol and with lactose monohydrate to a much, uh, much lower uh, time for nucleation. These are laboratory times in minutes, so they're kind of long, but they would translate to a much lower time in a commercial process. Uh, graphite, for example, which actually does have a commensurate lattice, doesn't template very well. So we have to look at the energetics on the molecular level in order to get a good template. Okay, uh, the second challenge, how can secondary and other bulk nucleation events be avoided? So this is a typical crystallizer with a stirrer, it's called MSMPR. The problem is there's too much shear in that stirrer. That doesn't work. We need more gentle stirring, and we need to control supersaturation very carefully to get the right nucleation. So we've done that with a fluidized bed crystallizer. So in the, towards the middle, you have a column crystallizer. You have recycling, okay? And so you have circulation, and the circulation provides the mixing. Remember, this is continuous, so it's not just mixed in a batch mode, it's mixed in a continuous mode where you have continuous feed of acetaminophen in ethanol solution together with the D-mannitol. 
And with this, you have to control the supersaturation ratio, which you can very well uh, using process analytical technology. This is a laboratory setup. Here's the column towards the left there and some of the feed vessels on the right. Here's how the process works. There's some startup. So this is the concentration of acetaminophen, which we can measure online continuously. Um, in the beginning, at zero time, we go through a nucleation and growth, growth phase. That's the startup. And then after that, we go through a steady state. That's the first steady state there via our control system. We can shift that to a new production rate at a new steady state. Okay? So in theory, you could run this for weeks on end at whatever steady state you choose. Here's just a picture of what it looks like, the acetaminophen on the D-mannitol. And this is just an example of the concentration profile um, in the run and the various loadings. This is only about 20% loading, but we can go up to 50% loading. So these are the kind of tablets we made from these. Um, we actually, just for <laughs> purpose of disclosure, we had to add some uh, bulking agent and mag sterate. Uh, to get the right properties. So work in progress to do without those additional steps. Um, we get good dissolution time, 80% in 30 minutes, so a typical dissolution curve, so we're able to get the properties we want. Uh, and I think I mentioned, or didn't mention, but it was on the slide, friability is, is perfect. So we can meet specs with this process, um, which is a technology to do end-to-end -end uh, continuous manufacturing for solid oral dosage forms in which you can s see that the paradigm has changed between drug substance and drug product going to continuous and integration. I'd like to finish in the next couple of minutes with this particular technology to show you a bit more advantages of continuous processing, lyophilization, because this is uh, something that's foremost on my mind. None of this has been well, I guess some of it's been just recently published, but uh, it's very new, hot off the press work. Um, so the idea is continuous freeze drying of unit dosage. So these are dosage forms uh, that can't be made into tablets, uh, that have to be dissolved for, for injection. So they're solid materials, not necessarily oral though. Um, encompasses integrated processing, modular, much smaller footprint, and in particular inline monitoring. Uh, this is just a schematic. It's not a uh, actual diagram, but it's a schematic of the process, not an actual diagram of the equipment. The idea is, though, you can have continuous fill. Okay, so you can have continuous fill. Essentially, it's a continuous process. It's just run in batch, but you could do that continuously. You go through these various stages from freezing to primary drying to secondary drying. The reason why I, I think this is an important process to move to continuous is because it shows all the advantages. Reduction of cycle time, chamber volume, reduction of cost, homogeneity, modularity, and flexibility. And in particular, the lyophilization processes today lead to a lot of product loss and they can be very cumbersome processes. So this is a particular area in which moving to continuous will be of tremendous advantage. And how am I doing for time? Am I, I about 10 minutes left? OK. Should, well, it says zero now, because I guess we started a little early. But I'll spend a few more minutes, then we'll, we'll stop for questions. OK. So here's some preliminary results. One of the big advantages of going to continuous is that we control the system very well. And so this is simulated in the laboratory. Uh, on vials, so it's not actually a continuous process yet, but it's simulated just to give us the advantages. And this shows you uh, dosage form and the difference between conventional on the left and the suspended vials, uh, continuous freeze drying on the right, where you see much better porosity. And that gives much better heat and mass transfer, in particular mass transfer. Uh, processing time, depending on whether you go long or short cycles, uh, you see that typical processing time on the left is over 100 hours. Uh, the red is the cycle time. The black before that 
Below that is the downtime. There's no downtime in continuous, so that can be 60% or more less in terms of time. In the short cycles, it can be even more. And these are just estimates. We think that potentially we could have a much, much higher advantages. Another big advantage is the volume goes down tremendously. Uh, so we talked about decreasing footprint. The chamber volume here on the left is about 16 cubic meters uh, for a batch process. For continuous process, it can be 75% or more less than that. Okay, so the tremendous advantages of going to continuous. Heating fluid temperature can be much higher because we have much better control. Uh, and so if the temperature is on the y-axis, for batch, it's much lower. For an aggressive cycle, you can do it much higher, close to continuous, but you get significant product loss. Because of the enhanced control of a continuous process, we, get, we can go much better in terms of temperature. So just to summarize, uh, batch processes uh, versus continuous, we don't have this additional downtime for loading, testing, et cetera. Uh, freezing may be about the same, but much better drying. And, much, and we don't have the downtime on the, on the end side either. So tremendous advantage in terms of time, also a reduction of equipment and volume. So total processing time from a batch process, let's say 100 plus hours to 40 hours or less in a continuous process. Okay? And much less if it's a shorter circle time, cycle time. And again, uh, chamber volume uh, significantly less. On the left, on a batch process, up to 16 cubic meters, um, much less, maybe four cubic meters or, or lower on the right. So just to summarize, kind of overall, I started out by giving an overview about continuous manufacturing, its benefits, benefits that I think the industry pretty much all agrees on, but also the challenge in getting there. And I do think there'll be an inflection point. The question is when that inflection point is going to occur. Uh, there are many technologies that can be enabled with significant benefits. I just talked about two today. I mentioned these two because you may not be familiar with them. Hopefully you'll think they're a bit cutting edge, particularly I like the going from the molecular interactions all the way to the process design on the continuous crystallization technology. Uh, Technology development, as I've indicated, is essential. There's still a lot of room for technology development. Again, I know EMA continues to develop. It's one of the leaders in developing continuous manufacturing technologies. But as I also indicated, it's not the limiting step. There are other issues which hopefully will get to this inflection point and get over those issues. And so we can all help to make it happen. So with that, I'd like to, this is my group now, uh, thank you all for your attention and looking forward to addressing any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Trout uh, provided really a mix of uh, strategic approaches to the development and execution of continuous manufacturing, and also some cutting edge technologies that's, that's more work in progress. I think with that, we'll open the floor for, for discussion. So, uh, any questions from the floor? Yes, Lawrence. Mr. Trout, uh, uh, how far are we with, uh, with this, uh, the uh, continuous uh, uh, freeze drying design from a commercial application, uh, capacity wise? Is it still lab scale what you're working on, or is it, is it really useful already for a commercial uh, opportunity? Right now, it's still lab scale. So we're working at, the, at MIT right now as we speak in, uh, in, well, working on a fully automated design. So we're working on the mechanical engineering aspects of it now. So what I showed you was uh, pro based on process simulations from real data in the lab. Uh, so we're getting there. Hopefully a year from now, we'll have a full model. Thank you. Hi, this is Sandeep from CIPLA. So, my question is again on continuous uh, life relation. How about uh, the primary and secondary drying? Have you considered in there or we get rid of that with the new process? Yes, uh, of course. 
So, thank you. This is a great question because it also, I think, is, indicates some of the different ways of thinking with continuous. So, why don't we think about not as primary or secondary drying, but as controlled drying? So we divide it in these two with kind of a batch mentality because we have a certain setting on the primary, a certain setting on the secondary. What if we can measure to a degree that we need to, let's say moisture content over time, and we adjust the drying continuously in an automated fashion so that we get the right specs going out. So all that can be addressed together in the same drying cycle, which is a a drying cycle in which the heat amount changes over the cycle. So again, you know, it correlates with whatever we claim, the change in the footprint of, you know, the chamber. So the, what you have shown, the ch uh, there is a reduction in the chamber size. Yeah, so about 70, oh, I guess it's off, about 75%. Remember, that's the total volume. In a sense, it's not a chamber anymore because it's it continuous. moves continuously. Yeah. It's probably going to be like a zigzag loop but it's going to be the total volume, about 75% less, maybe more. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Okay, we will uh, have one more question. We'll have go back and come back to you. Go ahead, please. Uh, Dr. Miriam from Ben Lebanon. Um, I just, uh, as you now said, it's uh, now on the lab scale, but uh, passing to uh, the manufacturing, would we, be, would we will have problem in validation such process? And because it's a continuous, and oh, how we can sense. address the process validation, especially to our regulatory authorities? Oh, excellent. I'm glad you asked that. That's a fantastic question. Uh, I'll give my view as a technology person, and then Dr. Nasser is actually the <laughs> foremost expert on this, uh, so he could say more about it. So um, we're working closely with the FDA, again, the EMA also, but with this project, closely with the FDA on this project. And there seems to be a big gap from one side to the other, because the FDA keeps saying, you're not going to have problems. Yeah, there'll be bumps along the way, but we're going to work you through that, and we're going to get you through this process. There have been now six processes approved, I think maybe five, four or five in the US. They've all gone through smoothly. I mean, there have been bumps, I'm sure, along the way, but they've all gone through. Um, the companies are very happy with that, with how they've gone through. And so, as I am told continuously from the regulatory authorities, they will work with you to make sure that this goes through uh, without an issue. Dr. Nasser is actually the expert, having been an official at the FDA and continues to consult in this area. Right, so I agree with, the, with Professor Trout. I don't think there is a major problem. However, uh, validation remains critical in order to be able to commercialize and release the batch. I will speak a little bit about that in my presentation now. Uh, but the good news uh, is that ICHQ13, a new guideline under development and continuous manufacturing now, uh, is taking place. As a matter of fact, they met in Amsterdam in June. They will be meeting in November uh, in Singapore. And validation of continuous processes is one of the main tasks. Uh, hopefully, there will be a more of a global alignment uh, because FDA is more accepting of continued process verification, etc., whereas some other regulatory authorities are not. So I'm hopeful that ICHQ 13 will address that uh, at the global level. Other questions? I know there is one in the front, but I'm interested to get someone from the back first. Ish, please. Uh, go ahead. Hello. Please identify yourself. Yes, I'm Mafei from Alpha Sigma, and I have a question. Um, are there any examples up to now of uh, a crystallization of API with an excipient, but with also a change of polymorph, for example, from anhydrous to hydrate or vice versa? And also, um, what is the point of view of this changing of polymorph uh, uh, the point of view of the regulatory agencies. Okay, so um, I should emphasize that these technologies are all in the laboratory now. As far as I know, they have not been commercialized. We're working there, and again, Dr. Masha will speak this afternoon about trying to get industry there. Um, 
We've done a lot of work, though, on the polymorph issue. Um, I think everyone's familiar, but maybe just uh, a few seconds on this. So solid crystals can come in different crystalline forms, different polymorphs, which can have very different properties. And so um, this is a great question because continuous manufacturing can allow us, together with an excipient, can allow us to, to form and stabilize metastable polymorphs if we want to. We've done extensive work. You have to tune the conditions um, in, of the process, which you can do in a straightforward way once you have them via continuous processes in a way that a batch process you can't. Um, and then also the interaction with the excipient is going to stabilize that particular polymorph. And just one more, I could talk about this for a long time. I won't, though. We can talk more at a break. But so since you know about polymorph issues, you might be familiar with this concept of disappearing polymorphs, the idea that there's some metastable polymorph that's found. And then when a more stable polymorph is found, no one else in decades has been able to find the so-called disappeared polymorph, the metastable one. Using this templating technology, we've been able to reproduce in the laboratory formerly disappeared polymorphs. So thanks for that great question. This is exactly the idea behind continuous, is to control what you want, to have the product you want with exactly the specs you want by tuning the process that'll get you there. Uh, if, I, if I can add, uh, uh, the US FDA published a guideline recently on co-crystals. So I think the regulator have been started thinking about the idea of not using the ABI as such, but mixing it with an exhibient uh, to facilitate uh, processing. There's one question here. Yeah, that's a ni nice presentation. First of all, thanks to you. Uh, I am Velayan from Dr. Eddie's India. Uh, so we are working uh, currently for the, uh, you know, oral solid doses forms in continuous manufacturing. So as per my understanding, in oral solid doses forms, uh, no scale. That one question came that, you know, it's a lab scale to uh, commercial scale. It, it, it's not a scale dependent, right? Because it's, that's the main advantage of, you know, continuous manufacturing. Uh, is this, uh, scale, is this uh, scale or the strategy applied to when we are manufacturing biologics or uh, any uh, injectable liabilization or excipient manufacturing. That is, that, is, that is my question. Okay, yeah, exactly. So one, that's right. One of the big advantages is that instead of scaling up in terms of volume, you scale up in terms of time. So you have a process, let's say, for phase three, which you can run for a week or something to produce the phase three product, for example. Um, and then that same process, you can run continuously 50 weeks a year, let's say, with some downtime for maintenance to produce 50x uh, continuously. So exactly. And yes, the idea for biologics is it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same concepts. Um, I mean, that's, I didn't talk much about biologics because obviously this focus on solid oral dosage forms. Um, but that's a major part of what we're working on, too, is biological processes. There are whole conferences just devoted to that. We do mention that in some of our, our white papers, too, and some of our other published papers. Um, but yes, the, everything that I talked about in terms of the broad concepts are equally applicable to biologics. Same, same thing in terms of scale up and, and elsewhere. Thank you. Great. I think with that, we'll conclude uh, the discussion. And I would like to ask you to join me to thank Professor Trout for our outstanding presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.